Uh, uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, today's presentation, Holistic Sustainable Food Production, <clears throat> Food Production at Living Energy Farm. There, uh, Living Energy Farm, we have our own way of doing things, certainly. Uh, I tell people when I talk about green building, if you ask 10 different carpenters how to build a doghouse, you get 10 different doghouses. Well, the same is true, or even more so true, uh, for growing food, that uh, there are as many different ways to farm as there are farmers. Uh, our methods are, we aren't a living farming. Uh, we grow seeds, uh, and we also grow uh, a lot of our own food. This year in particular, I think we will probably hit about 90% of our own food that we're going to grow ourselves. So we're not backyard gardeners, not that there's anything wrong with being a backyard gardener, but we use uh, methods that are scaled to what we want to do. Uh, so uh, if you're gardening in your own backyard, you can scale up, scale down, uh, naturally a lot of different ways of doing things. Uh, and our food systems are mixed in with, or integrated with uh, the rest of our systems at Living Energy Farm. Uh, specifically, we are an off-grid community. Uh, we operate largely without fossil fuel. We are still using a little bit of gasoline in the tractors at this point, but our residential energy systems are completely off-grid, uh, fossil fuel free, and our food production, uh, food processing is all integrated with that. So we're using energy, solar energy to dry food. We're using uh, renewable energy sources to cook food. Um, uh, the picture you're looking at, the first slide, is looking back towards our house, shot right through the branches of a fruit tree. So we have, uh, of course, a small yard in the front yard where the kids can run around. Uh, but putting orchards on the south side of your house uh, helps keep the solar clear. And if you have trees out there, it's surprising how, you know, over time, especially you build a house and you get pine trees, oak trees, whatever, these big trees, they'll grow in over time and close in your solar clearing. Well, if you put <coughs> food production right in front of your house, gardens, uh, orchards, you uh, can keep your solar clearing open and maintain the, uh, and you know, get, get some productivity out of that land too. Um, how can we sustainably feed people in a crowded world? How can you grow your own food in a sustainable, satisfying, and healthy way? Uh, so Living Energy Farm is a little bit different in that we are, we are not, uh, we differentiate between uh, self-sufficiency and uh, global sustainability. A lot of people build, they build a cabin on the mountaintop, uh, shovel a bunch of firewood into it, uh, run a bunch of cattle and, and call it sustainable, it's really self-sufficient. You can do certain things if you have a lot of land and a lot of firewood that uh, most of the people in the world can't do. At Living Energy Farm, we're trying to create a model that is as much as possible can be applied around the world. So it's not just how do we grow food for ourselves, how do we do it in an organic, sustainable way, how can we do it in a way that is uh, that poor people all over the world can do, or how can we be, in, be of some benefit <clears throat> into uh, helping, uh, you know, sustain all of humanity, <coughs> developing the tools to help sustain ourselves. So the uh, second slide is actually the first slide in reverse. Uh, this is uh, right at the front of our house looking out. So again, you see the orchards right out in front of the house. Uh, and then beyond the orchard is a field. That is one of our primary food production fields. And that picture was taken day before yesterday. Uh, so this is, uh, spring in Virginia, uh, you'll notice there's a bit of a brown strip right there in the middle of that field. That's where we just in the last week or so uh, planted a bunch of summer vegetables. You'll notice the rest of that field is green on the right side, on the left side. Um, cover cropping and keeping your soil covered with green material is, uh, I think, the single biggest uh, asset, uh, particularly if you're a backyard gardener and you can bring in a bunch of bags of mulch and do mulch gardening. I, I've done a bunch of that. I really love it. It's great if you're in a city. Uh, just pick up all the leaves and grass clippings your neighbors throw away. Uh, hopefully you're not getting grass clippings from somebody who's using a bunch of chemicals in the yard. But in any case, uh, mulch gardening is great. If you're doing larger scale farming, we're not big scale, but even on the order of a few acres, you can't mulch garden. You can't uh, bring in that much mulch. So growing your own mulch, basically growing cover crops. Uh, so that field you're looking at on the right side, that is a mix of a couple of different kinds of clover. On the left side, it's a mix of rye and wheat. Uh, and that'll get plowed in uh, this spring as we need to plant more of that field, but it keeps the ground covered, <clears throat> it builds up organic matter, and it keeps the soil healthier. There are a lot of complicated theories, ideas, opinions about how to maintain soil health, uh, build soil health, 
my uh, approach is uh, quite simplistic. And I should say that I'm not the, actually the one, I'm certainly not running this farm by myself. My wife actually, uh, partner, uh, does most of the planning and the, the operations around the farming. But I don't think she would argue with me, certainly, that uh, there's no such thing as too, many, too much organic matter. Organic matter in the soil, uh, building healthy soil is really the single big backbone factor of running a successful organic healthy food production uh, process. I want to read through this whole paragraph I got uh, posted at the top of this slide because my wife actually drafted this. We do uh, off-grid immersives at Living Energy Farm. We have a website, of course, livingenergyfarm.org, uh, where we bring people out for these immersives on the weekend. You live with us the whole weekend. And we alternate between doing food and energy focus. So when we do a, a food focused weekend, we talk about spend largely the whole weekend doing workshops on how to grow food. Um, and my wife drafted some documents for that. And I think this paragraph really summarizes a lot of our approach at Living Energy Farms. So I'll read it. At LEF, the strategies we use to work towards our goals are inspired by several agricultural philosophies, including permaculture, biointensive mini farming, and large scale mechanized organic farming. We aim to balance the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. Permaculture is strong in earth care, but often does not focus on productivity or land use efficiency. Biointensive methods are strong in land efficiency and productivity, but are very labor intensive. Large scale mechanized organic farmer is labor efficient, but often does not meet our earth care goals. But all of these philosophies, as well as what we know about indigenous farming methods, have a lot to offer a balanced approach. Using a mix of these approaches, LEF is developing the means to feed ourselves using only farm-grown fuel. We're developing a prototype of food and energy self-sufficiency that we hope can spread around the world. So that uh, I think that's an excellent summary. Uh, we look at all these various uh, ideas and systems people have come up with, and we try to find the best, best mix for what we're doing. And at the end of the, day, end of the day, we earn a living doing it. Now, we're not wealthy, and Living Energy Farm is, is really a, a bigger project than just the farm itself. So we have an educational component. You can actually give us donations if you want to. Um, and so there, there are different aspects of the project. But the farm itself is not only grows most of our food, but it's, it's an economically uh, uh, self-sufficient operation. You can, you can earn a living doing what we're doing. Uh, we are continuing to develop, learn about, uh, use different cover crop mixes. As I said, cover crop is really the backbone and building organic matter is really the backbone of farming anything than in your yard. Uh, in your yard, like I said, just mulch the bejesus out of everything and you're great. Um, I took this picture to show a couple of different generations of cover crop. The cover crop on the right hand side where all that uh, pretty red stuff is, that's crimson clover that was sowed last fall. Uh, and then uh, the stuff on the left hand side is a little bit more sparse. Uh, that's because it was sowed only a few weeks ago. It's what's called uh, frost sowing. You get out there when the ground is still freezing and thawing and you throw your clover seeds out and the uh, freezing and thawing generates kind of a little bit of a, a heave on top of the soil, a little bit of muddiness on top of the soil, and that um, germinates your seeds, and then they can sprout and grow if it's the right kind of seeds. Um, so this is different approaches to cover crop right there. Um, whole foods plant-based diet. This is a really another fundamental thing. Um, and I'll go ahead and read this paragraph. Uh, this is not a quote from uh, Lester Brown, but it's, it's his information from his book. The reference there is for the book. If everyone ate the average American diet, the world could feed only 2.5 billion people. If everyone ate the average Italian diet, the world could feed 5 billion people. If everyone ate the average Indian diet, the world could feed 10 billion people. Uh, so that those there's a lot of debate out there about what's nutritious and about uh, grass-fed beef, building up soil, and take whatever position you want to on that. Uh, but there is a very fundamental issue here that uh, to sustain people in an efficient way, uh, uh, human diets need to be plant-based. I think also from a health perspective, they need to be plant-based. Now, plant-based does not mean vegan. It doesn't even necessarily mean vegetarian. It means plant-based. Uh, some people use whole foods plant-based. So it just means you're, you're mostly eating plants. It's what hunter-gatherers did. Some people, the paleo thing is kind of nuts. People don't know what they're talking about when they eat a bunch of, of greasy beef and, and call it paleo. That's not paleo. Uh, if you study anthropology, you know that humans ate uh, basically, acorns don't run away and the squirrels do. So we eat a lot of acorns and less squirrels. Um, so we eat a plant-centered diet. Uh, we do keep a few animals. There's our ducks. Uh, there's a duck right in the foreground there wondering what the heck's going on. And then there's their decorated duck coop in the back. So animals should not be the center of a self-sustaining agricultural system, but they can be a useful part. When you are living on a plant-based diet, a little bit of animal product goes a long way. 
uh, our ducks not only provide us a few eggs along and along, they're easy to feed. We find that they're easier to manage than chickens. They also snap up the bugs, so they reduce the bug pressure in our orchard. This picture is actually overlaps with the last two pictures. This is taken just to the left of those other two pictures. In other words, still in our front yard. So these ducks are nibbling up all the bugs that would be chewing on our fruit trees. Uh, they're nibbling up the ticks uh, that would be biting our children. Uh, so we love our ducks. We think they're great. Uh, Plant-based diet, a few animals mixed in there. Uh, we think that's the right balance. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about nutrition, but I am going to throw this one book at you. Unfortunately, there's a massive amount of misinformation out there about nutrition more than any other science. That science has been corrupted. Uh, I find the book that is uh, a very scientifically scrupulous book, the, the, the China study, and that looks over this whole issue of, of nutrition and health, and I'll let you uh, uh, peruse that on your own time. Uh, so uh, we do live on a plant-based diet. We do earn, do earn our living growing seeds. Um, the bulk crops that we find the easiest to grow in our climate, corn, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, peas, and wheat. Uh, this is where we can get a lot of calories for ourselves to feed the ducks too. Uh, we, the corn that you see hanging in their bags, we grow a bunch of corn every year. Uh, we grow heirloom corns, uh, open pollinated corn. Uh, so uh, most of the world's food supply is controlled now by a small handful of corporations that breed hybrid and GMO seeds so that the farmers every year have to buy seeds from uh, the big corporations, Syngenta, Monsanto, these big corporations. It means a dozen people have control over the world's food supply, most of the world's food supply. That's a very bad thing. Uh, what you see hanging in that bag is an open pollinated corn. It's not hybrid, it's not GMO. Uh, simply the corn passes pollen from one plant to the other, produces a viable seed that can then be planted and replanted for uh, generations into the future. Uh, we sell hundreds and hundreds of pounds of this seed. We do different corn varieties each year. The stuff that we're saving for ourselves to eat, we hang it up in bags like this just to keep the rodents out of it. Now, there's other ways to store it. You can store it in buckets if you keep it dry. Um, we, we have a number of 100-year-old machines we use at Living Energy Farm. Sometimes the old machines work great. Uh, that's our 100-year-old corn shuller. Uh, you get a crew going there. They can go through hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of pounds of corn uh, in an hour or two. Uh, so we like our old machines. Um, uh, we use our Kentucky Rainbow Corn as well as our other products, uh, like I say, uh, for food for ourselves, food for our animals. Uh, we sell it to grow for seed. This is our solar powered grain grinder, uh, so we can grind that corn directly as it is. We make grits. Uh, my wife recently has per perfected or developed, uh, nixtilization is the term uh, that the American Indians treated their corn with wood ash. Uh, that uh, changes the nutritional composition of the corn a bit, uh, makes some of the nutrients more available, uh, and it makes the corn sticky, so you can make tortillas out of it, basically. Uh, so this is corn that we're uh, grinding dry. We'll make grits out of it, make corn flour out of it. Uh, we mix the corn flour in. Like I'll, I'll often make pancakes in the morning, so we've got our own homegrown wheat. Uh, I'll throw in a, a, a eight or ten different grains, including our own homegrown corn. Uh, we did homegrown wheat uh, last year, uh, very small crop. We've got a bigger crop this year. Um, so the question of uh, can sustainable agriculture feed us? Can organic agriculture feed us? Before we started Living Energy Farm, you know, people would ask that question or bring that issue up and I'd kind of shrug and say, I don't know. Uh, industrial agriculture is dependent on uh, massive uh, nitrogen fertilizer inputs. Uh, can we really feed humanity without all that industrial agriculture? Now that we've been doing Living Energy Farm, I feel a lot more uh, confident in answering that question. Yeah, certainly we can, especially if we give up our addiction to animal foods. You get rid of the cheeseburgers, and it's really pretty easy. Uh, these grains, as long as that's where most of our calories are coming from, they're tremendously productive. This is another open pollinated corn that we grew a couple of years ago, Tennessee red cob. These uh, open pollinated corns, they are not quite as under optimal conditions, they will not produce 300 bushels an acre the way the hybrids will, but they come pretty close and they actually do better than the hybrids under suboptimal conditions. Like last year, we had a horrible drought. It was rough. Uh, and productivity was not optimal. It wasn't, it, but the, uh, the heirloom, these heirloom corns will uh, produce pretty well, even under pretty rough conditions. So, <clears throat> Excuse me, I want to take a drink of water there. Uh, so uh, these heirloom grains are not 
or not weak. They're, they're strong producers, uh, and they, they can feed us. They can feed us. They can take care of our communities. They can take care of a modest flocks of poultry and other uh, things that we need to, we want to do. Uh, you know, if you're trying to create McDonald's cheeseburgers, that's, that's a whole other question. Uh, lima beans. This is a bean that we've had great success with, super easy to grow, particularly if you're in a warmer climate. One big advantage of these beans, uh, the deer don't eat them. We have significant deer problems. Uh, we try to discourage them. There's uh, a lot of different ways to deal with, deal with deer. Fortunately, we have enough coyotes around that they seem to take care of the uh, groundhogs for us. And the rabbits, they can be trouble sometimes, but the deer, uh, they're the worst. Uh, we have several methods of deer control. Uh, one is to simply plant things the deer don't eat, which is a pretty short list. And as the deer get hungry or as their population density grows, they will start eating things they never ate in the past. Uh, but the lima beans are great. The deer don't mess with them very much. The, the deer control methods that we do use, um, we, have a, we keep a hound dog around. Uh, she's great. She gets out there and yaps at them. That helps quite a bit. Uh, we do a three-wire electric fence. So at the peak of productivity. This doesn't work year round because it's more of a psychological intimidation fence than a serious deer fence. You can do serious big, you know, eight, ten foot tall heavy duty deer fences. If you can afford to put that around your whole farm, great. We can't afford that really and the way the land is laid out, it's pretty impractical for us. There's a, an approach to using electric fences. If you use an electric fence <clears throat> and you just put up one fence, the deer will jump over it. Uh, and even if you put up a high fence, the problem is when the deer jump that top wire, if both of their feet are off the ground when they hit that top wire, it doesn't shock them. Uh, but there is a method of using two electric fences. So you drive a, a line of stakes, uh, fence posts. You can use rebar or the little plastic press-in posts, whatever, whatever. You don't need heavy-duty posts. And then three feet away from that, you set up another line of posts. Uh, the inner line of posts, the first line of posts that's closer to your crop, you put two electric wires, and they can be the plastic wires so the animals can see them, which is that, that braided wire that they often use for uh, well, it's just a braided plastic with metal mixed into it. Or if you're going to use a metal wire, you need to put a bunch of flagging on it. But the animals need to be able to see it. Then, on the, uh, So you do two strands of wire there, one high, one low. On the outer fence, three feet away from that, you put a, a third wire. Uh, again, it needs to be a visible wire. And then you get aluminum foil. You wrap it around that out, outer wire. And you get some peanut butter. Uh, you put it on that outer wire. And you put the electric fence charge uh, on these wires. And what happens is the deer come up there and they sniff that peanut butter and they reach out and lick it with their tongue, and that electric fence pops them right on the tongue, and they don't like that. Um, so they back away from that. We've been farming out here for eight years now, and six out of the eight years, the electric fence has worked pretty well. Uh, the final resort, of course, is to hunt deer. Um, we have done some of that. Uh, in different, Every state's different. In Virginia, you can pull a, a permit to kill deer off season. Do that if we have to. We do earn a living growing seeds, so we protect them when we have to. Um, so wheat has been another fantastic crop for us. If you build up your soil really well uh, and you've got good organic soil, lots of healthy organic matter, lots of earthworms crawling around in there, then the steps to growing wheat consist of plant it and harvest it. That's all you need to do. Uh, the crop you see again, this is a picture taken only a couple of days ago. Uh, you can see the big green stripe up the middle of the picture. The brown stripe in the foreground in front of that picture is our white potatoes, Irish potatoes. Uh, they actually got nipped a little bit by the frost. Unfortunately, we had yet another late frost. This uh, climate madness is already causing uh, trouble. Uh, people who grow food know that. Growing food is getting a little bit harder every year. And that's not, very few people are, most people aren't aware of that. It's not causing people to change their behavior. So what's going to stop us? I don't know, mass starvation. I hope we get wise up before that comes. But in any case, so that big green stripe up the middle, that is organic uh, wheat. Now that wheat has not been fertilized with chemical fertilizer. As you can see, it is very lush, very thick, uh, fantastically productive. Uh, last year, we harvested wheat using a wheat cradle and a scythe. That's that thing on top of the, the chipper there. Um, so you swing that beast through the wheat, and, the, the, uh, and it you know, that cradle catches the wheat. If you're really good at it, you can kind of twirl that wheat up and set down a shock. Uh, I am not that good with it, and I'm, I'm not all that strong, actually. I mean, I grew up a country boy, but I'm a small friend. Uh, so I don't, I, you know, I can do it, but Lordy, I don't, I can't do it as well as some other people can do it. Uh, so anyway, we uh, scythed up the wheat. Unfortunately, while we were scything it, occasionally a, a wheat plant, the whole plant would just rip right out of the ground, and we got dirt mixed in with our wheat. So the chipper that that scythe is sitting on top of, that's just an ordinary residential chipper, and we just poured the straw right in the top of that thing, 
and we took the screen out of the bottom of it because uh, it's got it's basically a big hammer mill if you know what that is it's a big grinder uh, so it would just kind of thrash the thrash the bejesus out of everything uh, uh, and it so it functioned as a thresher so then the stuff coming out of the bottom was a mix of wheat kernels and a bunch of kind of ground up straw we took that and winnowed it uh, you know just poured it in front of a fan a DC fan in this case solar power uh, and, but we had to do that over and over and over again and in the end we had some dirt left in the grain it was a tremendous amount of work so it worked but it was uh, it was really it was difficult uh, now back in the old days people used to do this you know when you were hungry uh, uh, people would do this and the whole family and the whole community would get out there and, and they're good at it. They knew what they were doing and stationary threshers. Uh, the word combine, like a combine, combine harvester that harvests grains, uh, comes from the, uh, the fact that they created uh, reaper binders, uh, mowers that would go out there and cut the grain and put it in shocks uh, that would stay in the field. And then you go through the field, pick those shocks up and throw them into the thresher. So the machine that combined the uh, reaper binder with the thresher is the combine. That's how that combine, that combine got its name. So after much consideration, one of the roles of living energy farm, like we said, is can we do this on a global scale? And it's really hard to know, you know, so what they do in the poorest parts of, of uh, the world versus wealthier parts, north, south. I mean, agriculture in particular has to be locally adapted. It also is gonna be adapted to the local resources. How much machinery can you afford to buy? Uh, whatever. Uh, so what is, you know, there's no absolute line of sustainability. Uh, for us, we decided to buy a tiny little Chinese combine. Uh, you cannot buy anything like this in the United States. There are maybe a dozen companies in China that make these as well as in India. Um, this is the cheapest one we can find. And we just got this a few days ago as well. That's the packing crate around it there. I just started putting it together. Uh, so what we're going to try to do is uh, we're working with uh, bio uh, feed, wood gas and turpentine as farm grown fuels. Uh, maybe a combine is too expensive for the poorest of the poor, but is everybody in the world going to get out there with a scythe? I don't know. So I don't know. I can't make a, a final, you know, a impassioned argument that this is the appropriate level of mechanization. It's a small level of mechanization. So what we decided to do, I don't know if it's the best thing or not, but I knew for us, we just, we couldn't, we can't effectively side that wheat for, it needs to get done. You know, you got dry spell in the spring. It's the perfect time to cut it. You need to get out there and do it. I'm not strong enough. We don't have a big community around us. We've got a small community. We decided to go buy a little combine. And it's a cute little machine, I have to say. Um, it, uh, the welding is not superb and it's very homemade. Uh, I'll show you the next picture. See, they took ordinary wheels, like a trailer wheel, and then welded a hub right into it. Uh, the pulleys on that machine, instead of going out and buying pulleys, which pulleys are pretty cheap, they bent this metal and then welded it up theirself. This is made in a small metal shop in China. We communicated them with them directly. We dealt with the whole import process, which was bureaucratic and headachy and cost a little more than I wanted. But in the end, we got a, a fairly cheap little combine. It, the design seems pretty good, even though the workmanship is... Uh, you know, it's a very homemade machine. So we're going to see. My hope is, uh, turpentine is where I'm putting my big hope at this point. We, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, hopefully we can put a turpentine engine on this thing and make it go. Um, sweet potatoes have been another fantastic crop for us. Of course, you know, I'm focusing on the staple crops here, but we grow a lot of, you know, carrots and, uh, you know, uh, green beans and okra and tomatoes and all this stuff. We do a lot of those actually for food. Sweet corn, of course, we love. Uh, so, uh, but I, I've been focusing on the staple crops, but the, the same principles that apply to growing staple crops apply to growing all those lovely vegetables, building up your soil, balancing your soil, organic matter, uh, that all uh, is, it's all the, the same process or similar process. So sweet potatoes are a huge staple crop around the world, especially in warmer climates. You can grow them even in somewhat cooler climates if you sprout them indoors in the spring. Uh, and the other cool thing about sweet potatoes I grew up in the South, down in Georgia, sweet potatoes keep people, have kept sweet potatoes and field peas, kept the poor people out alive for centuries. And we would put the potatoes right out in the field because we had a longer growing season. Uh, and I never knew the leaves were edible. Uh, it turns out in Asia that they had bred some varieties specifically for um, salad greens, basically for eating the leaves. But even with just your ordinary sweet potatoes, if you pick the young leaves, you don't want the old ragged leaves at the end of summertime. But the young leaves, they're very tasty, they're wonderful. Uh, of course, the deer and the rabbits love them too, so you got to protect them. Uh, but anyway, this is how you start sweet potatoes if you're in a climate where you need to get them going indoors. Now, people usually save the smaller sweet potatoes, whichever you can choose. The smaller ones, you can simply fit more 
in a tray. You put them in some nice potting soil in a warm window, wet it down, and uh, do this in the early, early spring, very late winter uh, in a warm room, and they will start growing little green shoots. Uh, once those shoots get up six, eight inches or so, you cut them off, uh, you stick them in a jar of water. Uh, they sit in that jar of water for a few days a week. You'll see the little green roots sprouting out of them. And you take them out of the jar of water, you put them in, in flats, just in like that flat where the uh, potatoes themselves were. Uh, with some soil, uh, they start to grow into little plants. And then once you pass your last frost, uh, you take them out into the field and transplant them out into the field. Um, uh, the deer and rabbit love them. Uh, rabbits with an S. Uh, you, you definitely need to protect them. We basically grow them near enough to the house where I can see them because the deer inevitably get into them. And once the deer are there, uh, they have to be pushed back out through whatever means. Um, so yeah, sweet potatoes are a fantastic crop for us. The difference, I mean, it's funny that sweet potatoes and white potatoes are both called potatoes because they bear no uh, resemblance whatsoever to each other uh, genetically. They're totally different plants. Um, so what was I gonna say? Uh, in any case, the big one big advantage of sweet potatoes particularly if you're in a warmer climate. With the white potatoes, you can't save your seed year to year. Uh, you start to build the virus load, uh, disease load in the potatoes themselves. With the sweet potatoes, you can save your sweet, sweet potatoes from one year to the next, to the next, to the next, uh, for generations. In fact, the farm I grew up on, we had uh, our, our own heirloom sweet potatoes uh, that we'd had since forever. Uh, so you can't, for white potatoes, they grow them in colder climates and they, they rogue them, which basically means walk down the row and rip the disease plants out try to control the disease load. So people in the South are perpetually buying their sweet potatoes from seed producers in the North. That's okay, but uh, being able to grow your own seed is really fun too. So uh, in terms of growing seed, uh, this is a seed crew processing out some seeds at Living Energy Farm. Uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the corporate controlled hybrid and GMO seeds uh, leave a few people in control of the world's food supply, and we, are part, we earn our living as part of the movement trying to provide seeds that can produce plants that go on forever. So the process of growing seeds, <clears throat> as far as soil health and whatnot, is very similar to growing any other vegetable. <clears throat> we do rotate crops. Uh, here, I'm going to take another drink of water. Give me a little break. <clears throat> ah, there you go. Uh, so the process of growing vegetables, you still want healthy seed, you still want to rotate your crops. Now this gets a little bit tricky in a really small garden, but even in a really small garden, plant your tomatoes on the left side one year and on the right side the next year, because a lot of diseases that affect a lot of plants can uh, hold over in the soil. And if you put the same plant right back in the same soil year after year, you're going to get more and more diseases. Now, some plants are more susceptible to that than others, but generally speaking, you want to move things around. Uh, the process of growing seeds, if you're growing okra or any, any uh, vegetable for seed, the, the process of preparing it, you know, the seed preparation, the soil preparation, the soil health, how you would grow it is, is very similar to how you would grow it to food. There's no appreciable difference, except when it comes to harvest time. Uh, these yellow blobs that you're seeing at the feet of these people are actually, it's a round variety of cucumber. So when you're growing with most vegetables, when you want to take them all the way to the seed stage, you let them ripen out fully. Uh, you don't pick a green pepper when it's green. If it's going to turn yellow or red, you let it turn fully yellow or fully red. You let cucumbers go right to the yellow stage. You let watermelons go right to the mature stage, right on the edge of when they're starting to get mushy. Um, for wet processed seeds, for plants that are wet on the inside, uh, corn is dry, okra is dry, but all your melons and squash and all of that, tomatoes, all that stuff's wet. Cut it open and rake the seeds out into a bucket. Uh, it's about that simple. Um, Waga. Now, for some vegetables, uh, peppers are the best uh, in terms of getting to use the pepper and save the seed. Uh, for corn, you have to uh, you have to either plant it or, or or as a seed or eat it as food. You can't do both. But with the pepper, you get the food and the seed. So we let our peppers peppers. Let's say it's a red pepper. We let it go till it's fully red, fully ripe, and then we cut the core out. We drop those cores in a bucket. Uh, we pour some water on them. We ferment them. Uh, the fermentation time for different seeds is different. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Um, you can look it up uh, if you want to email us questions, but you can find, find it in, on the web. The fermentation is important for some seeds. Like for tomato seeds, for instance, they have at least a several day fermentation time. So you got it in a bucket with the, the tomato slot. Uh, you stir it twice a day. Uh, the seeds have a coating on the outside of the seeds, at least some, seed, some, some seeds do, 
and that coating is there so the seed can drop to the ground and lie in that wet winter soil all winter and then sprout the following spring. Well, when you, when you save your own seed, you want to be able to put them in the ground and you want them to sprout right away. So you've got to make that coating go away. So the fermentation makes that coating go away. Uh, so for some seeds, they do need to go through the fermentation process. Tomatoes, you can also save the seed and save the tomato. Uh, you can cut the tomato open. Uh, you kind of rake your fingers through there. The seeds are kind of in between the fleshy parts. You just pull this, the goopy, seedy part out into a bucket or a bowl, depending on how many you're doing. And then you can save that fleshy part and can it. Uh, if you, you know, keep your, your buckets and your bowls and whatnot not clean, of course, you don't want dirty food. Um, we do that sometimes. Uh, sometimes we take much quicker, dirtier, much a quicker, dirtier approach. This is a big bucket of tomatoes, just stomp the Jesus out of them. That's the fast way to do it. Um, uh, watermelons, uh, same thing. You cut them open and rake the seeds out. And again, you can choose. You can either just be quick and dirty and rake a bunch of seeds into a bucket, or you can save the watermelon flesh. You can cut them open and carefully cut out the heart of the watermelon, eat the heart of the watermelon, or rake the seeds into a bucket. Uh, if you keep your buckets clean, you can have one bucket that you rake the seeds into and another bucket that you rake the flesh into. And then just uh, if you've got like a big cheesecloth, you can just take that flesh and get a bunch of juice out of it. It's wonderful to drink. Uh, another thing you can do with watermelon juice, uh, you can boil it down. Uh, it has a sugar content that's similar to, uh, to sugar cane juice. Uh, the thing that we have learned, we've been doing this a couple of years, is that it does make a fairly dark juice. You end up with something closer to molasses than syrup. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to strain it or separate it a little better to get more of the solids out. Because even when you juice it, you got it's kind of uh, pulpy uh, to get the pulp out of there to make a lighter syrup. But we've been making watermelon syrup; it works okay, uh, not so bad for us. You know, we've got these big watermelon fields, a big, you know, in relative terms, quarter acre or something, and capturing all that juice and making syrup is of some use to us. Uh, so maybe this year, I'm hoping uh, we've got a good watermelon contract. Uh, we're going to be able to make watermelon syrup. Um, Arduous work. I couldn't help sticking this picture in there. That's a, a watermelon called an orange glow. Uh, one of the glorious things about growing seeds for us, you know, people buy, plant the same one or two varieties. And, and, you know, part of this whole thing with seed saving is, you know, 100 years ago, there were dozens and dozens of varieties of broccoli and carrots and watermelons and all these vegetables that we eat. And uh, because of the commercialization of seed under a few corporate uh, interests, the number of seeds available has been declining year by year by year. So uh, we discovered that there's all these old lost seeds. This is an orange flesh watermelon. There, of course, the red flesh watermelons are what people are accustomed to, but there's, there's white flesh. There's a bunch of different kinds. Uh, this is my daughter Rosa. And this is actually a couple of years ago when she was younger uh, with a slice of an orange glow. This orange glow is really delightful. And that's what we got a contract to grow again this year. So we're really excited. Uh, so for us, uh, there's some glory in growing these seeds, having a quarter acre of watermelons to munch your way through is uh well it's a lovely thing uh, and then we get to make watermelon syrup maybe hopefully we'll see um so the process of separating so i told you about fermenting uh, so the process of separating uh seeds from the fleshy matter of the uh, vegetable is a little bit different for different vegetables uh, for most vegetables you can uh, ferment them stir them like i say a couple times a day it does get nice and smelly and rotten that's part of the deal um, and then for most seeds, the good seeds float and the junk, uh, the good seeds sink and the junk floats, the bad seeds and the pulp and whatnot floats. So you basically can get two buckets or two bowls and you pour, you fill, uh, you take your bucket with your nasty smelly seed gunk in there, you pour a bunch of fresh water in it and then it's like panning for gold. You kind of swish it around and the gold, which in this case is the seeds, tends to kind of sink. You gently pour the, the junk off the top of it uh, and then you pour more water in there. You do that re-rinsing re over and over and over again. And finally, you end up with seeds that are more or less clean. The other method is what you see here. This is what's more uh, often done for watermelons, is you just take the pulp and, and put it on a screen. And the seeds go through the screen. Now, you need a, a screen that is matched to the seed size. Now, this is half-inch hardware cloth, which works pretty good for watermelon seeds. Uh, so you throw that pulp up there and the seeds go through it and most of the pulp stays uh, on top of your screen. Uh, with corn, okra, stuff like that, they're not fermented. They're simply shelled out by hand. Remember I showed you the corn sheller. Uh, you do want to be careful, like with shelling corn or okra or any of those things, you want to make sure it's good and dry. And particularly if you're going to use a machine to shell it, shell a little bit and look at it because if it's not fully hardened or if you have a machine like a thresher that's helping you do the shelling, 
it will often be knocking the eyes off the seed or damaging the seed. You got to make sure you're not damaging the seed. Um, anyway, so there's somewhat different processes for different seeds. Uh, uh, for the wet process seeds, like the tomato seeds, this is the final process. You you rinse them back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth until you got uh, just wet seeds in the bottom of the bucket. You pour them onto a screen. Now this is a fine screen. This is like a screen door screen, uh, and spread them out and just let them dry. Uh, you want imp or cool air. Uh, the commercial seed growers are people who do this on a bigger scale than we do it. They will, and they burn a lot of electricity doing it. They'll set up a room with an air conditioner and a dehumidifier. They'll put their wet seeds in that, so they keep it both cool and dehumidified. We have found that just simply blowing ambient air over the top of them is fine. What you don't want to do is put your seeds in a food dryer with a heater. Heat is bad for seeds. Uh, you don't want to heat them. But if you dry them in normal ambient conditions, make sure they get good and dry. Uh, I mean, you know, around 13%, I think, is where most seeds are good for long-term storage. But you'll get a sense of it after you do it for a while. It's like they need to be good and dry to the touch, not spongy. Uh, might take a few days or even a couple weeks if conditions are not optimal. Uh, then you can dry them down. You can put them in jars. If you've got fridge space, put them in a fridge. Got a root cellar, put them there. But seeds properly processed and properly stored can last for a number of years. Um, this is okra. Uh, we have a corn sheller, so we do a lot of corn. That's mechanized. For some of this stuff, we just shell it out by hand. You know, you can do a lot of okra fairly quickly by hand. We have done really big okra grow outs and used the full size combine. We're talking like a big four or six row monster diesel machine and pitchfork it into the front. Uh, you can do that. Uh, like I said, uh, any mechanized process of, of shelling out seeds, you've got to make really sure the machine is not actually damaging your seeds. But for okra, you just let it mature on the stalk. You cut it. You're going to have to use a pruning shear to cut it. Let it dry fully. We'll put it on shelves usually and let it dry down fully. And then you just sit around the sit around the wood stove in the winter and crack it out. These, this is not wintertime in this picture. Uh, shell it out uh, into buckets. You don't want to be a little bit dirty at that point. You just have some dust in it. If you just pour it in front of a box fan, let the fan blow the chaff away, uh, that'll clean it up. Um, so like I said, for some seeds, uh, we get to save the seed uh, and the vegetable. Uh, for peppers, we pull the core out for a minute, save it for seeds. This is an up-close picture of our food dryer. Now for us at Living Energy Farm, we have a mass big uh, solar hot air blowing system. We pull hot air off the roofs of the buildings. This is what I was talking about, our seed program being integrated with our whole renewable energy system. Uh, big hot air collector on the roof uh, with a solar powered, photovoltaic powered blower pulls that heat off the roof. Uh, and in the kitchen, our kitchen is separate from the house. We built a big closet around the hot air blower that heats the, the building. And then we put shelves in that, uh, in that big closet. And then we put stainless screens, racks in that big closet. We put a, a diversion in the duct right at floor level so we can blow the heat right out at floor level. And then there's a shutter up in the top of the closet. We can open that up. And we have a big industrial scale food dryer, solar powered, solar heated, solar electric powered. And we can throw a bushel of green beans in there or with the peppers, we can throw in a couple of bushels of peppers that we uh, obtained as a byproduct growing seeds. We dry them and we've learned some, some things work better than onions. Uh, the peppers are the best. The green beans are fantastic. Okra is good. Uh, sweet corn works good. You got to have more time to process it. Um, most vegetables will work pretty well. Um, melons, we found that we could dry them like cantaloupes. We could dry them, but they continue to deteriorate uh, even after they're dried in the jar. So they're not that good over time. Uh, onions are the same way. We can dry them, but their long term storage in non refrigerated conditions not that great. Uh, so, you know, some, some vegetables we dry a bunch of them, others not so much. Um, but drying, uh, particularly when you can tie it in with some other solar stuff, is fantastic. So, like I said, you know, if you're a backyard gardener, you're going to do it all with a shovel and a hoe. If you can find a bunch of mulch and do mulch gardening, that's the best. I'll tell you, um, when I lived in a, I lived in a Charlottesville, Virginia for a while before we started Living Energy Farm, and people think they have to dig up the yard to plant a garden. Well, you can, but you don't have to. Um, what I did, uh, I took a section of the yard that was heavy grass, you know, it had been yard for a long time. I laid down big sheets of, card, of cardboard. I found a, uh, a furniture warehouse near me where I could get futon boxes and refrigerator boxes. They're the best. Little cardboard boxes drive me crazy, but the big ones are great. So I bring a few of those in, pull the tape and the staples off of them, whatever, spread them out in the yard, and then I, I would lay as many leaves as I could get. The city disposes of leaves, right? 
so I could bring in, I, I just got them to bring me these trash trucks, uh, garbage trucks is what they used to pick up the leaves. So we're talking massive piles of leaves. I would pile that stuff two feet thick in the fall. You couldn't even walk through it. Uh, and then over the winter, it would settle down, settle down. By spring, you know, that stuff would settle down all the way to about six or eight inches. I'd kind of pull a hole back in the leaves, poke a hole in that cardboard and plant right through it. So I didn't break the soil at all. I never picked up a shovel. Uh, and the tomato plants I could grow were fantastic. Um, melons, fantastic. Now I'll tell you for that kind of gardening, that heavy mulch gardening using leaves in particular, uh, the plants that are not going to like that are the plants that are want more alkaline soil. So peppers, for instance, they don't they don't grow because the the tannins and the acids in the leaves it's too acidic for them. They don't like it. Uh, stuff that likes really hot soil, like okra, it's going to that thick mulch cools the soil, so to slow it down, you can still grow it. Um, but anyway, so I love mulch gardening. Now, Living Energy Farm, we are small-scale commercial farmers. We can't mulch garden. We do a lot of, uh, of, um, of uh, cover crops, like I was saying, as much as we can. But we're still we're farming for a living. We're doing a number of acres. We, we, we're using machinery. Uh, but we are trying to scale the machinery to, to keep it as small as we can, because smaller machinery is actually more efficient, and then try to make it work as efficiently as, as we can, to work as well as we can. So this tractor you're looking at here is called a Tough Built. This was built in the 1970s. That company is still in business and has moved to Nebraska. It's a, a ripoff or a modification of the old Chalmers G, which uh, the, what's different about it is it has the cultivators in front instead of in the back. Uh, yet another company that's making an almost identical tractor is called Ogun, which is O-G-G-U-N. Uh, they're a new company based in Alabama. And Ogun's idea is to build a small, weld-together tractor like this. In other words, it doesn't have a bunch of cast iron components. And they're shipping tractors all over the world where, with instructions, basically, for how to build them. So their distributors are also, hopefully, going to become tractor builders to build small, cheap tractors. Uh, so in Ethiopia, there's a steel plant in Ethiopia. I didn't know that. Uh, they can substitute Ethiopian steel uh, and build these tractors themselves and find an engine and make it work. Uh, in our case, we have an old, tough build. We're not wealthy. Uh, I think we're achieving remarkable things with the resources at our disposal, but that said, we don't have a lot of cash to throw around. So basically, we buy old, junky equipment and, and tear it apart and rebuild it to, to get stuff that works. So the deal with these little, small tractors is they're so light that they don't have any traction. The cool thing about the Ogun and the tough build and the old Chalmers G is the engine is right over the back wheels. So it puts that weight right on the back wheels, so you do get much improved traction. And then the cultivator, this one has, this is in the shop right now. I've got the engine off of it. The uh, cultivator is right in front of you, so you have very, very precise control over your cultivation. It's, it's kind of intimate cultivation, if you want to use that term. I can also mount the, mount the plant, uh, planter right in front there. I have an old coal planter. Those old coal planters are, are fantastic. So I can watch that planter run. I can watch each seed drop. I know exactly what that planter is doing the whole time I'm planting. Uh, the difference between this, if you're organic farming, you're not using herbicides, the difference between a behind you cultivator and in front of you cultivator is a lot, <coughs> a very big improvement in cultivation, a lot less work in terms of, of hand weeding and whatnot. Um, now for us, another part of the project is the farm grown fuel. Uh, I had talked about wood gas and turpentine. Uh, this is a wood gasification unit right here. Uh, that uh, wood gas, uh, I thought about doing a whole webinar on wood gas. It's like, man, don't teach what you don't know how to do. Uh, wood gas for us has been frustrating so far. We haven't made it work in a, in a systematic kind of way. Uh, and part of that's the wood gas and part of the fact that we're working with junky old machinery. But that said, uh, so wood gas was used a lot in World War II in Europe, uh, some in the U.S. But in Europe in particular, there was a systematic process of creating wood gasifiers. They had big factories making wood gasifiers. They had factories making wood pellets for the gasifiers. So that silver container, that drum you see right in the middle of the picture, uh, that's basically a drum full of wood chips. And down in the bottom of that drum, there is an hourglass shaped hearth. Uh, you set that hearth on fire, uh, set the wood chips on fire, and you have a, a kind of a smoldering burn, but it's a smoldering high temperature burn. Uh, it's basically a carbon monoxide generator. And you don't think of carbon monoxide as being a fuel, but it, it runs an engine, it runs a gasoline engine. The trick is getting it just right, so you get clean. There's a little bit of methane and some other gases mixed in there, but either way, you don't want smoke, you don't want creosote, you don't want uh, tar. Uh, if you can get clean gas coming out of that thing, it'll run a gasoline engine for a long, long time. In fact, they kept the wood gas programs going in Europe 
after World War II and they discovered that diesel engines, you can run a diesel with about 10% diesel, so the diesel actually ignites the, uh, you know, inside the cylinder and then about 90% wood gas. And a diesel engine run on wood gas lasts longer than a diesel engine run on straight diesel. So if you get it right, it's good, but getting it right for rinky-dink farmers like us has proven to be more challenging than I would have imagined. Well, we're still working on it. We had this gasifier on a Ford tractor, 35 horse, 600 series, if you remember tractors, and the gasifier was too small. I mean, it ran the tractor for a few weeks. I was having a great time, but then I said, you know, I've got to see if I can get full power out of this thing. I pulled the throttle down and basically melted the inside of the gasifier. Uh, we put it on an 18 horse tractor, uh, and the engine on the tractor was basically too worn out. Uh, but in this whole process, we've been learning more about engines and about the history of engines. So here's what some of what we learned, and it's really fascinating. So this is an old John Deere B. Uh, back before World War II, uh, the process of refining uh, crude oil was, was not as effective as it is today. So they didn't get a lot of gasoline out of the crude oil. They got a lot of uh, kerosene, basically, and they called it tractor fuel. So what John Deere did, John Deere in particular, uh, is they made these old tractors with two fuel tanks. They'd have a small gasoline tank and a bigger tractor fuel tank or kerosene tank. Um, so uh, gasoline is really volatile. It vaporizes really easily. So you'd start your engine on gasoline. You let it warm. Uh, and the way the manifold is designed on these tractors, the, uh, the intake uh, comes right by the exhaust. In other words, the exhaust warms up the intake. That's pretty common, actually, on a lot of engines. Uh, but once your intake gets up to about 200 degrees, you throw the valve uh, and start pulling kerosene in there, and the heat vaporizes the kerosene, and then you can run your tra tractor on what was, back in 1940, a much cheaper fuel. Uh, so these old tractors, and they built these dual fuel engines up into the 1950s. Uh, we don't, this tractor you're looking at is not our tractor. We're probably going to get one of these John Deere's at some point, but that's on, on our to-do list. Uh, so that's all fine and good. Interestingly, so we've worked with wood gas some. Uh, interestingly, turpentine is another fuel, and it's another fuel that doesn't com compete with humans uh, for food. These days, people get excited about ethanol and biodiesel. That's all about commuters who want to drive into work in the city and feel good about it. There's no biofuel that can support the automobile fleet that we have, and anybody that tells you otherwise is lying. Uh, so the biofuel movement, as it's currently uh, put together, is it threatens to starve poor people out. But we're hoping that things like turpentine, which comes from trees, can actually be done sustainably if we just keep it on the farm. We don't own a car. We run our whole farm. We run our, our whole program without any without personal ownership of an automobile. We bike into town. We have bike trailers. Not to be more righteous than anybody else out there, but I'm telling you. Uh, don't try to biofuel our automobile fleet with, uh, don't try to fuel automobiles with biofuel. In any case, so when you take pine sap from a pine tree, you heat it up, you distill what comes off of that uh, pine sap, that's turpentine. Turpentine burns exactly like kerosene. You've heard of Honda motorcycles. Honda was a Japanese man after World War II, ran motorcycles on Japan with turpentine. We are hoping to run our tractors on turpentine. What we have learned, though, is that the modern engines have been jacked up to run really fast. So here's a picture of two engines. The one on the left is actually 50% more horsepower than the one on the right, but the one on the right is a World War II vintage. It's an old Wisconsin. Uh, it moves slower. It has a much higher, much wider tolerance of fuel mixture. It's made to run on turpentine. So it'll run, it's made to run on uh, a kerosene, I mean, or it, it'll run on uh, kerosene or gasoline. So it should run just fine with turpentine. We're going to swap that engine onto that little green tractor you're looking at, pull the turpentine off of our pine trees, and then we can see how many pine trees. Does it hurt the pine trees? If we pull off a modest amount of turpentine, how many trees does it take? If we extrapolate that out to a bigger scale, how does that work? We'll see. Uh, this is all in process as we go along here. Um, so no-till farming is another thing that we've worked with a bit. Um, we are currently mostly doing tillage because we are commercial farming. We're, we're earning our living doing this. We're not just monkeying around here. Uh, a lot of farming these days is commercial no-till. Now, that's what you see in that left picture. You can take a hay field or a corn field. They plant the beans or the corn, soybeans or the corn, right into the stubble or in a hay field. They'll cut right through the grass and plant it right under the grass. And then they dump a huge amount of Roundup 
uh, the glyphosate right on there and it kills everything. It'll turn a hayfield into a desert overnight or into a, a wasteland. And that glyphosate, of course, ends up in the food. And now they're doing all these blood tests in Germany in particular and finding that the GMO proteins, these weird proteins that they're sticking in the GMO foods, as well as the glyphosate, are in people's bloodstream. Surprise, surprise. It gets into your body. Uh, so we've tried some organic no-till. The idea with organic no-till is you grow a cover crop, like you grow rye. Uh, and with rye, it's called crimping. You kind of just run over it, basically, right when it's about to seed and the rye kind of just gives up and dies and then you plant uh, in the stubble and there's enough uh, organic matter there to kind of smother out the weeds. So that's no-till without the herbicides. That's how it's supposed to work. Now what we have found trying it so far is we haven't gotten it to work all that well. Um, the weeds, particularly if you have a rainy year, you just get a ton of weeds and then you're out there whacking on them with a hoe and you, you can't till it because all that junk, instead of plowing it in, you left it on top of the ground. But uh, we recently found Salamander Farm. Now the picture on the right there is from Salamander, Salamander Springs Farm. Uh, Susan Lean, she's down in Kentucky. Uh, permaculture is a complicated word these days. Uh, there are a lot of noble ambitions and too many egos wrapped up in, that, uh, in the word permaculture. So we get a lot of advice from people talking about permaculture who don't know what they're doing and have never earned a living farming. That said, the idea of doing no-till uh, is fantastic. So what Susan's done, it's unusual among permaculture, she's stayed on the same piece of land for, for over 15 years now. And so she's not just giving advice, she's figuring out how to do it. And she's kind of turned out, she's improved it. What she's done is instead of growing just rye, she uh, takes a, a, a mix of cover crops. She gets a really dense, a really heavy cover crop mix. She's been siding it down by hand. So you see somebody out there in a, in a field whacking on it, man, I don't have the strength to do that. But in any case, planting through the stubble and then and that's working for her uh, so that's we've been talking with her a bunch that's where we're going next our hope is to try to take her methods and make them commercially viable um, if you know what a sickle bar mower is it's a mower but it's not a lawn mower it's, it's the mower with a little blade that, that shuffles back and forth so you can scoot it right along at ground level and the stuff just kind of falls over. A, a mower like a bush hog or a lawnmower is kind of fling stuff all over the place. So what, what we're going to be doing is trying to take Susan Lean's methods, uh, use the sickle bar mower, plant through the stubble, uh, use the, try to use some of the mix of cover crops because she, instead of just doing rye, she'll do rye and wheat and vetch and uh, tillage radish and clover, get all that mixed together. We grew a crop of clover last year. That's funny, that crop of clover I showed you in the earlier picture. Uh, this year we've had a really cold spring and a lot of deer pressure over the winter. Last year we had cover crop that clover was a, about up, in, up to my shins, about two and a half feet tall and so thick I couldn't plow it under. I was plow, pulling a full scale plow through there, a disc plow, but you know, a big heavy iron beast of a plow and it was clogging up the, the dang plow that was so thick. So in a good year, this cover crop will grow really thick. Uh, so what Susan does is she actually sows the seed out there, like corn, well, not with corn, but beans in particular. Throws the seed out there before she mows it. Then she goes out and scythes it. So all that organic matter lays on top of the seeds. That provides enough moisture for the beans to sprout. They poke right through the cover crop, and then the cover crop smothers the weeds. And if you get that systematized over a number of years, you reduce your weed seed load. That's another big issue in farming in general is how many weeds did you leave from last year? Uh, you know, at the, end of, at the end of the farming season, it's, it's tough to get out there and pull the last of those weeds, but you need to think about what you're leaving yourself next year for seeds. Anyway, so this is where we're going. Hopefully we can commercialize organic no-till. I know there's a bunch of other people around the country working on that issue uh, and probably some of them are way ahead of us uh, or just have more resources to work on it. We're trying to mix in the farm grown fuel and see how it all works on a, you know, uh, a really self-sustainable basis, uh, sustaining basis. Um, so uh, I'm going to read through this uh, quick. Uh, this is just a list of books and other people that we have relied on. Uh, there are three women actually who live in the same, within 30 miles of where we live. We've all published books in the last few years. Uh, are all friends of ours, and they're all great books. Uh, Ira Wallace, uh, Vegetable Growing in the Southeast. She runs, so that she's a, the moving force behind Southern Exposure Seed Exchange uh, in 
Virginia, Louisa, Virginia, where we live, uh, her guard, her vegetable, her, her book is great for new gardeners, especially. She's really good at like just explaining to you, you're not a great gardener. This is how you do it. This is how you make it work. Uh, Cindy Carner, Growing a Sustainable Diet. She's really good. Uh, she leans kind of more our direction in terms of looking at, okay, well, how do I do this holistic food thing? And we've uh, learned a lot from her in terms of, of you know, getting from garden to plate, how to feed yourself, basically. Uh, Pam Dollar, she's another friend of ours, Sustainable Market Gardening is her book. Pam is one of these very, very uh, organized gardeners, keeps meticulous records. Uh, her uh, claim to fame or what she's really mastered is successional planning. She keeps vegetables growing 12 months out of the year in Virginia uh, and, and just has really, uh, her cover crop charts in her book uh, are great. She's got things really well organized. So that's a, a more almost academic sort of book, uh, uh, and great book. So three great, great people that we know locally. Uh, Michael McConkey is a, he's a close, a good friend of mine now. His nursery, Edible Landscaping, but the website alone is a fantastic resource. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about fruit trees right now because we're actually doing the next two webinars on fruit trees. Uh, so we'll talk about that. My booklet, uh, there's the website for it. That's about fruit trees. We'll talk more about that later. Commonwealth Seed Growers, that is a cooperatively owned seed organization that we're part of. Um, the Resilient Gardener by Carol Depp. Uh, Elliot Coleman's got good books. Uh, so there, you can read through all of this on your own. Uh, there's some of the resources that we have found useful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the presentation, and uh, if we want to, can we go ahead and open up for questions now? Hello. Yes. Hello. All right. So that was another another great presentation from Alexis. So uh, um, let me open up the questions from audience, um, and we have. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Here's one. Any thoughts about the legal issues of neighbors in urban communities uh, blocking solar access? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I I don't know if you have any legal ground for telling your neighbor to you know not, not block your solar access. Uh, so yeah, I'm afraid I don't have any anything useful to say about that other than try to be friend, you know, maybe if, whatever you can do to do it on a friendly basis rather than a legal basis, but I, I have no information about the legal side of it. All right. I guess um, there isn't any, right? Like you can put up solar panels on your property um, and if it doesn't block anybody's um, well, I, I don't know, honestly, but my my basic crude understanding, I know with trees, if there's a tree standing on your property and a limb falls from your tree onto your neighbor's car and damages your neighbor's car, you're responsible for the damage. Right. So you're responsible for something on your property that hangs over your neighbor's property. But if a tree on your property is shading your neighbor's property or a tree on your, on your neighbor's property is shading your property, I would. Uh, I, I. I. There may be some areas where there's some legal framework around that. I, I, I could think I can say with fair confidence in Virginia that you there's no uh, legislation around shading. If your neighbor's stuff is shading your stuff, I don't think you have any legal grounds for challenging that. I think the best you can do is go over and and either. Try to talk to them or bribe them or do whatever you can. But I think that if anything that shades you, I think you just, I don't think there's anything you can do about it. I, I don't know. But I haven't heard of, of there being any legal precedent for, uh, right. uh, you know, there's such a thing as mineral rights. Like you can own a piece of, of land that somebody else has the mineral rights. Somebody can come onto your land and drill. For oil and dig for coal, if they have mineral rights on your land, and have never heard of shade rights or, or solar rights. I mean, maybe that's the legislation of the future, but I've never 
never heard of it. Okay. And I've actually bought and sold it and dealt with a little bit in the real estate world. I mean, not in any big way, but just dealing with farmland and whatnot. I, I've never heard the term, you know, shade rights or solar rights. Uh, I don't think it exists in a legal framework. All right. Yeah. Okay, here's a question from Robert Hayes. Um, he says, I wonder if Living Energy Farm has tried any of uh, those Lister Indians. Uh, some Someone is importing them um, unassembled to Canada. Um, someplace, I believe, Jim Mason at the uh, ship in, in uh, Oakland, California has adopted the Lister one cylinder veggie oil uh, powdered engines for use with wood gas. Okay, yes, so, uh, I'm quite familiar with the Lister engine. Uh, I mean, the advantage of the Lister is it's, it's an old fashioned low RPM. Uh, diesel engine. Uh, to adapt them to wood gas, you have to retrofit a spark system on it. That's not too hard. I've looked at the process of retrofitting them. Um, I'm, uh, so yeah, we, we might want to get a lister. Uh, there's actually now an, uh, at least one Indian company that's making, uh, I wish I could remember, remember the name of it. I could find it, but I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. But uh, the Lister style engine, in other words, a low RPM flywheel diesel engine, it would be good for alternative fuels, for good for wood gas at least. Uh, so there's there's other Indian companies now making those quote unquote Lister diesels, even though it's not a brand name Lister. Um, so yeah, they would be great for stationary power with wood gas, maybe even a small tractor. Uh, for turpentine, they're not going to work. Uh, uh, for turpentine, you actually need, need a lower compression engine. Diesel engines have a much higher compression than gasoline engines. Uh, the turpentine in a higher compression engine will pre-ignite. In other words, as the piston is coming up towards peak compression, that turpentine will set will will ignite. Too early, uh, and it will. Uh, you can't run it straight through the diesel injectors. You'd have to run it through an intake, uh, and you it would not like mad and would blow your engine apart. So, in as much as I has looked, looked at the Lister diesels, they would they are a good engine for wood gas. Everything I don't have one, but everything that makes me Everything I know about it makes me think that would be true, but not, not a good engine for turpentine. The uh, the Wisconsin's that you saw earlier, those would be great uh, turpentine engines. Any old school, I think 6.5 to 1 is kind of what you want, or below 6.5 to 1 as a compression ratio is what you want for turpentine and kerosene, and that basically means a flathead gasoline engine. We actually have an old flywheel engine, um, a 1917 uh, flywheel engine. It's, it's similar to the Lister. It's even slower than the Lister. The Lister is like a thousand and fifteen hundred RPM engine. The flywheel engine we have is like a five hundred RPM, RPM engine, and that would be great for alternative fuel as well. I haven't got that hooked up right now. Uh, but those old slow engines are definitely what you want. Uh, so yeah, if you're looking into these renewable fuels, uh, those old engines, the slow engines, they're they're good for renewable fuel and they last half for forever. They're very different than these modern engines that kind of just blow themselves apart in a few years. Uh, um, so Robert, I hope you got your answer um, on that. And folks, we are, 
are coming up against it. Um, by the way, the PDF for this week's presentation is not uh, available right now, um, but it will be um, available as an as an, an attachment to the uh, replay on the video. when we post it. So it'll be probably posted tomorrow or maybe later on uh, today even. All right, so look for that on eatcommunity.com and we'll take a couple of more questions. Probably let me see if we have more uh, before we wrap up here. So here's another question. Any thoughts on on uh, the use of multiple species of cover crop for biodiversity. Uh, I am not a cover crop expert, but based on my expertise, mixing cover crops is a fantastic idea. Again, that's what Susan Celine has been doing. She's been mixing a bunch of different cover Crops. Uh, so I think that's brilliant. I think that's great. And I think, you know, the, my issue with permaculture, so what I tell people is you need to stay on the same piece of dirt and figure out what works. So, yeah, I, if you're doing cover crops, start mixing stuff up and see what works. Uh, uh, I think it's on our resource list. There's a book, uh, Grow, Growing Cover Crops Profitably. Uh, that's a great book. Susan Lean's work is great. Uh, Pam Dahl's work has got a bunch of on cover crops. If you look at those three, those three sources, you're going to know way more about cover crops than I do. I'm not a cover crop expert, except that I think cover crops are really great. Uh, and for us, the issue is because, you know, what you do in your backyard, again, is different than what we do, you know, on acres of land to earn a living. So we're going to have to actually or choose to adjust the cover crop seed rates based on not only what's effective, but what's cost effective. Some of these cover crop seeds are a little pricey. And my wife and I have been talking about it. She runs the farm, a lot of the farming operation. It's like, you know, we got to figure out a mix that's not going to throw all our profit right back out into the field and cover crop. But that said, uh, I think the right mix of cover crop is probably the uh, the silver bullet or the golden bullet to making this organic no-till work right. Uh, so yeah, and that cover crop is going to vary depending on what season you're planting in. You know, some of these cover crops, some of them are fall planted, some of them are spring planted. Rye, you can plant almost any time. Uh, how easy it is to kill. Some of these cover crops uh, die more easily than others. How well it goes through the mower. You know, how drought resistant it is. How, how good of a, a, a cover crop arrives. But, yeah, so figuring all that out with the Right mix of cover crops, and you know, uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of other people working on this, and I think that is the, the cutting edge. That's what is going to make agriculture work in the next century. Is figuring out this organic no-till, figuring out the right mix of cover crops, and how how to handle that whole system. I'm re really excited about it, and I wish we were further along. I wish I could say, hey, this is what we're doing, and here's the kind of mower we're using. And here's the, the kind of cover crops, but we're we're just exploring it as with these other things. I mean, our residential electrical energy systems are working fantastically well, and these other systems are an ongoing research project. Okay. Um, here are some. Uh, Alicia put up some links in the chat, so. The there's some great uh, resources. Thank you for that. 
Alicia. Uh, Robert says, thanks uh, for all this stupendous info you've uh, um, offered us here. I really um, appreciate your uh, presentation. So, okay, that. Robert Very saying well. thank you. All right. So I don't see any other questions. Uh, folks, uh, I think we will end here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, thank you, Alexis, for this uh, amazing presentation once again. Uh, you can all go back and watch the replays. And I highly recommend that you do that. Um, may everybody um, stay tuned for the webinar highlights of the week and, and um, I just uh, um, come back next week now and would like to say uh, um, uh, you know have a great weekend, and, and, and Alexis, if you have any last words um, to end on, please go ahead. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. The next two presentations we're doing, we're going to do orchard planting next week and grafting and propagation the week after that. And uh, that uh, we've taught that for quite a while now. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to doing that. That's going to be a lot of fun. So hopefully we'll see some of you next week. Great. All right, so everybody, thanks for joining and uh, see you next week. And right now, I'm going to um, start the highlights of the week. And it's goodbye for Alex. And uh, here comes the webinar hot slides.